Hey everyone, uh, what a privilege and a joy it is to be here and to share with you on this day on uh, at ACJC Chapel. And today we're going to cover a very fundamental topic, which is about building healthy relationships. Building healthy relationships. Now, if you Google the longest study, uh, you will come up with most likely the Harvard Longitudinal Study. It started in 1938 with 268 uh, uh, Harvard uh, students. It started then and now it's grown to 1,300 participants and it has still continued to, to go on. Now, what were they studying in the Harvard Longitudinal Study? Well, they were studying at the factors that influence the factors that influence well-being, health, and happiness in life. What are the things that lead to well-being, health, and happiness in someone's life? And they've been doing this now for almost sorry, they've been doing this now for over 80 years. 80 years, and this is what they have found this these this is the wisdom to what they have found they said this the surprising finding is that our relationships and how happy we are in our relationships has a powerful influence on our health said robert waldinger director of the study a psychiatrist at massachusetts general hospital and and professor at psych professor of psychiatry at harvard medical school Taking care of your body is important. Exercise, all that's important. But tending to your relationships is a form of self-care too. That, I think, is the revelation. So what did they realize? They realized this, that taking care of our relationships and having healthy relationships and relating well to our, 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 our friends, our our partners, our eventually our life partners, our parents, our teachers, all that stuff is so critical to the well-being of life. And they went on to say this, close relationships, close relationships, more than money, more than fame, are what keep people happy throughout their lives. The study revealed those ties protect people from life's discontents, help to delay mental and physical decline and are better predictors of long and happy lives than social class, IQ, or even genes. That finding proved true across the board among both the Harvard men and the inner city participants, meaning this, how well we manage, how well we are at keeping close, fulfilling relationships is the key indicator, according to this study, on someone's overall well-being across their lives. So my question to us is this, how good are you at keeping close, healthy relationships? How good are you and how many close, true, close friends do you have? You know, um, in school and in education, uh, we have so many important subjects to cover like math, science, uh, economics, uh, social studies, history, literature, all that kind of stuff. And all those subjects are very fundamental and very important. But when I read the revelations and the findings from this study, it tells me something that as much as we learn these great subjects of math, science, history, literature, uh, etc., economics, these are all great things to study, but so much more than being good at maths. I think what's even more important is learning how to maintain and develop healthy relationships. And I think that's something that no one had ever taught me. I, I, I had to figure this stuff myself out. So, and I'm just wondering if I was uh, uh, to rewrite a school curriculum, one of the subjects I would have that I would make everybody be a part of is learning to develop healthy, important relationships. So what I want to do today is just give us three simple principles that I help that I hope will help us develop healthy relationships. You know, I don't have a whole year, I don't have a whole curriculum to cover with you, but these are true for me and I hope that these will be true for you. That whatever you're going through, um, I hope that developing healthy relationships is a priority for you. And here are just three quick things that I think can help us. 
Okay, and it applies to all kinds of relationships, whether one day you get married, whether you're dating someone right now, uh, and our relationships at home, our relationship with our siblings, our relationship with our teachers, friends, etc. Okay, first one, I would say this, okay? First one, be slow to blame, be quick to take responsibility. Be slow to blame and quick to take responsibility. Now, it's human nature to blame other people. When there's a conflict, it's that person's fault. When something doesn't work out right, it's the external environment's fault. If I didn't do well in test, it's my teacher's fault. You know, my, my friend kept talking to me during class. My pen stopped working. The person I was sitting next to didn't smell right and I didn't, and I, and I didn't do the best I could on this test. It's very easy and it's human nature for us to uh, uh, blame as soon as something goes wrong. And we see this even in the first humans, Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis, when sin entered the world and God was like, what did you do, Adam? Adam said, why did I eat of the fruit, right? It's the woman that you put me here. He blamed Eve straight away. And then what did Eve do? You know why I ate of the fruit? It's that serpent. It's the serpent's fault, right? It's not my fault. It's the serpent's fault. So in the very beginning, we see human nature as one who uh, uh, is prone to blame. We are prone to look at everybody else's flaws and how it's ev- all my problems are the result of everything that has happened around me, my parents, my school, this thing, my, my sibling, etc. Now, I'm not going to say those things didn't matter. Sure, our external environment has, does have an impact on us. Absolutely, your upbringing has a huge impact on who you are and who you will become. Absolutely, without a doubt. But when I say be slow to blame and be quick to take responsibility, what I mean is this. There comes a time where we say, sure, Adam could have said, you know, God, you're right. I'm sorry. I should have led Eve and I should have told her and been very clear not to eat of the fruit that you told us not to. God, you're right. When the fruit was in my hands, I should have said no. There is a place in our maturity to instead of to blame someone else when something goes wrong, to actually say, hold on for a second. I want to take ownership of my part that I play in this. For Adam and Eve, it's for Adam to say, you know what? It was my part. I, when the fruit was in my hand, that's on me, God, and I'm sorry. Eve could have said, you know, when the snake was deceiving me and I was telling the snake, God said this, you know, I own the fact that I should have stuck to your word, God, and I'm sorry about that. And I don't know about you, but whatever kind of fights that you're in, uh, and I know me, whenever I'm in a conflict situation, I just think it's, it's everyone else's fault. If that person didn't do this and didn't say this and didn't act this way, then I wouldn't be upset and I wouldn't be angry. But I'm learning, I'm learning to own my responsibility. Maybe if I didn't react that way, maybe if I didn't say that, this person wouldn't have done this and that. You know, the reality is that um, when Adam and Eve sinned, it just divided us. And when we resort to blame and we fail to take responsibility over our own, our own, over our own actions, that doesn't create healthy relationship. That only seeks to break down the relationships that we have. And I just want to have a question for us. Is there anyone that we are blaming today? You know, is there anyone that we are blaming today? Our sibling, our friend, our parent. And you know, I'm not taking away, if they had done something wrong to you, I'm not taking that away and saying, you shouldn't feel upset. Sure, you should feel upset. If you are uh, uh, wronged or if you're offended, that's valid. But in the midst of that, instead of feeling... Uh, uh, self-pity and thinking I'm just the victim of my circumstances there comes a place in developing healthy relationships in saying you know what these bad things have happened to me I've been treated unfairly I've been mistreated okay that wasn't fair at all but you know what I'm not gonna let that dictate and define who I will always be I can't let that happen so sure those things have happened to me but I need to take responsibility that these things have happened to me and grow up from that and say, you know what, God, help me to grow up from this. What do I need to learn from this? 
And I can't change what's happened to me, but I can change my mindset and take responsibility over my growth that is to happen. Okay, so first one, be slow to blame. Instead of saying, that person's fault, that person's fault, it's you, you, you. Slow to blame and quick to take responsibility. Oh, in that conflict, did I, did I contribute to that? Did I do anything to make this person really upset and that's why they did this? Sorry that I held on to this uh, uh, anger that I had towards you that led you to do this. Okay, so that's one of the parts of maturing and growing up. Slow to blame and quick to take responsibility. Second thing in developing healthy relationships, grow in self-awareness. Grow in self-awareness. You know, everyone knows having a high IQ is a good thing, but one of the greater indicators in the workplace, instead of having a high IQ, is a high EQ, emotional quotient. And EQ can work both ways, EQ self and EQ others. EQ self means I have an awareness of how I'm feeling, um, I know uh, 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 what's going on inside of me, or oh, that person really triggered me, or I might feel a bit envious, or I feel a bit compared to, or I feel a little bit insecure. And that's, and that's having some sort of self-awareness, which is good. Or I'm more drawn to these kinds of people, I find this frustrating. And that kind of self-awareness is important. And there are different tools that you could use to help you be more aware of who you are. There are personality tests and stuff like that that I've done that have helped me. Um, Myers Briggs, Enneagram. These are just DISC personality profile. They're just after reading the person, after reading the personality profile for the first time, I was like, "How does this person know me so well?" So just reading those things helps as a starter. But as much as there is IQ, there, uh, sorry, EQ self, there is EQ others. Being aware of how we come across to somebody else, and I think if we could grow in that. Uh, that would be really important in growing healthy relationships. I was, eat, uh, I was in a meeting recently and in this meeting, I was getting frustrated. I was getting triggered because what frustrates me in a meeting is when the agenda is not clear and this person's going on a tangent. And in that meeting, I said to my other friend, I was like, I'm frustrated. Okay. And then I said, and then when this person was presenting, I stopped them and I said, what's the point of why you're doing what you're doing? And then after the meeting, I asked my friend, hey, do you think I was uh, a bit harsh? Do you think I came across too frustrated during that meeting? And he was like, no, not really, what not. But I just wanted to be aware of how I was coming across to someone else. So in developing healthy relationships, one of the key factors is knowing who you are. The more we know who we are, the clearer we are to give ourselves to someone. The more aware I am of myself, the more I grow in my awareness of understanding someone else and they feel understood and known by me where a healthy friendship or relationship can occur. You know, um, one of the most uh, uh, theological uh, uh, pieces of work in our time was John Calvin's uh, uh, Christian Institutes, essentially. And in the very first part of his Christian Institutes, the very first chapter, it's labeled the connection between knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. And he says this, for in the first place, no man or woman can take a survey of himself, but he must immediately turn to the contemplation of God in whom he lives and moves. Since it is evident that the talents which we possess are not from ourselves and that our very existence is nothing but a subsistence in God alone. And he's making the point that if we are truly to know anything of ourselves, about ourselves, we need to know the one who created us, who essentially in his words, um, since it is evident that the talents which we possess are not from ourselves, but from God. And so I think in growing in healthy relationships is the knowledge of self, growing in self-awareness. And the knowledge of self begins with the knowledge of God, knowing who God is. David in uh, Psalms 139, he said this, Search me, O Lord, you have searched me. Uh, verses one, Psalm 139, verse 1. O Lord, you've searched me. You've seen my rising up when I sit down, when I sleep. There's nothing that I do that you don't know of. God, you know me better than myself. But the funny thing is, at the end of that psalm, he says, Search me, O God. Try me 
and know my heart and know my anxious thoughts. Meaning, God, you've already searched me, but search me again. And I don't know where you are in the relationship with God, but there is an aspect of God searching us and helping us see what is really going on in our hearts. There's only a limit to you figuring out who you are. There's only a limit to that. But if we truly discover who God is, God starts to reveal who we are to ourselves. And that's a dangerous and confronting journey. But when you share that journey with other people, you'll start to realize, hey, you're building a healthy relationship. You're building a healthy, vulnerable, open relationship. And I'm very grateful that almost once a week, uh, two of my close friends, we we, we, uh, uh, call each other online and we just share updates in our lives. And And some of the stuff is actually very vulnerable. And it's because as God is searching us, we are sharing about what God is doing. And those relationships are high trust, very authentic relationships. And I'm very grateful that I have the gift of these friendships in my life. Okay, so first one, what is it? Be slow to blame, be quick to take responsibility. Second one, grow in self-awareness. And third one, and I'll end with this, is learn to forgive. Learn to forgive. That's it. You know, bitterness and unforgiveness can choke your soul and bind you in a prison of hatred. Uh, There was recently, um, uh, studies have said, holding on to bitterness can affect metabolism, immune response or organ function and lead to physical disease, researchers say. You can Google it for yourself if you like. And the reality is, Unforgiveness is something that we that all of us will probably face. You know, the reality is we can't shield ourselves from being offended and mistreated. If there's one thing I'll promise you in this life is that you're most likely going to be offended. Sorry, you will definitely be offended by someone and most likely be mistreated by someone in our lives. We can't stop bad things from happening to us. So what's more important than Um, What do we do? Do we just try to stop bad things from happening? Do we just try to control our lives, live in a cave so nothing bad could ever happen to us and we'll never be offended? No, that's not realistic. But this is what we can do. I believe we can grow and learn in our capacity to forgive. It's very easy to hold on to a grudge. And even right now as I speak, you're thinking of certain grudges that you are holding on to oh if i could he- if i could beat this person up if i could really hammer that person down it's natural and normal to hold a grudge but i encourage you to learn to forgive that when you're offended you've already made up in your mind the direction i'm going with this is forgiveness i'm going to move towards forgiveness so How do we forgive someone? How do we forgive? Now, can I just say that when it comes to forgiveness, I'm not here saying, you just forgive, quick, forgive, quick, hurry up, forgive. No, no, no. I believe forgiveness is a process. It takes time. And I don't want you guys to rush forgiveness. But let me just give us some key processes, some key steps to help us to forgive. Number one, acknowledge what happened. Just be upfront and say, you know what? This person was really abusive to me and acknowledge that and to say and because of that it really hurt it really upset me it really hurt my feelings it really uh, 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 broke me in a lot of ways and just acknowledging that this injustice has happened secondly identify what it is exactly that this person did to upset you this person may have done a lot of things but it's just one word one moment of embarrassment, one moment of making you feel ashamed, one moment of making you feel small. Ah, that's what it was. That person made me feel so small. Oh, that's what it was. That person continued to lose their temper at me. Identify what it is. Okay? And then, step three, and this is a not an easy one, empathize with the person. Try your best to see Why do you think that person was doing that? Oh, it's because that person's a mean person. Fair enough. Fair enough. 
the one thing I've learned about people is they do to others what was done to them. People do to others what was done to them. If someone is abusing others, it's very likely this person was abused. If someone is making someone else feel very small, it's most likely that person has been, has been made to feel very small. If someone is continually angry at someone else, it's because someone has been very angry to them. And to pause for a second and say, hang on, why did this person do what they did? And that could take some time. And that's okay. And you might still not want to forgive this person. Be like, oh, so it's still unfair. But pausing for a second makes you think, actually, I can understand that person and I empathize with that person. And when you get to that point, that's 80% of the victory. Good job. You are doing well. Number four, confront the person. If the situation allows you, you could just say to this person, hey, you know, what you did really upset me. You could write a letter. That's what I did once when someone had been um, continually losing their temper with me. I ended up writing this person a letter and just detailing how I felt. And I was so happy I did that. Confront the person. Number four. Number five, fine, last one, release forgiveness. You can say, you know what? I forgive you. I forgive you and the offense and the hurt that you caused I forgive you and when you get to that point wow you're free from that prison you're free from the power that person excuse me had over you with whatever they said or did to you that is very empowering and notice I didn't jump to just forgive the person straight away no go through that process step by step acknowledge identify, empathize, confront, and then eventually release. God, help me to forgive this person. You know, uh, in my life, there have been things, people have gossiped behind my back. There have been criticism that I've received. People have publicly shamed me. Um, people have uh, continued to lose their temper at me. Uh, people have talked behind my back. And those were very, very painful moments. And for there was a period where I had to actually learn and go through forgiving each person and each situation that I faced. And I want to build this muscle of forgiveness. I want to learn how to forgive people so that no matter what happens, because I know many more offenses are going to come my way, but no matter what happens, learn to exercise forgiveness. So just very three, three quick things for us today. Uh, be slow to blame and be quick to take responsibility. Grow in our self-awareness and finally learn to forgive. Learn to forgive. And in closing, I just want to say this. In uh, the book of Romans, uh, it says in God's word that whilst we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Whilst we were enemies of God, that's when God sent his son to die for us. When we were most unworthy, that's when God saved us. And if I want to look at someone who reconciled me to God, and if the greatest example of someone who exercised forgiveness, it's the person of Jesus Christ. And he is my inspiration to exercise forgiveness. On the cross, whilst being crucified, the most unfair thing that had happened to him, an innocent man, uh, punished, shamed, and executed whilst he was on that cross. You know what he said? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Wow. Imagine if we could learn to act that way. So, ACJC, thank you so much for letting me come and share. Uh, I leave those simple thoughts with us, and I pray that we would grow towards having and building healthy relationships. Mm -hmm.